Coming up on Talking Points, the 2022 midterms are over, and most of the results are in, including the congressional race here in Syracuse. Those details in just a few moments. And former President Donald Trump has been teasing a 2024 presidential bid for the past year. He's supposed to make a major announcement tomorrow night. We'll discuss how a potential Trump run could change the 2024 Republican presidential primary. Plus, President Biden and Democrats are celebrating a successful midterm election cycle. We'll dive deeper into why the red wave may have failed. Talking Point starts right now. It's been six nights since polls have closed in America, and we still don't know who will have control of the House next year. Welcome to this edition of Talking Points. I'm Benjamin Schiller. And I'm Jake Morell. Chilakase Adeli and Tegan Brown have the night off tonight. We do know that Democrats will retain control of the Senate until at least the 2024 election. Let's start our post-election coverage off with the current count of House races that have been called in America. According to results from the decision yesterday, GOP is on the brink of reclaiming the House. They have now won 215 House seats, while the Democrats have won 201 seats. This is the first time in four years that the House will most likely be controlled by the Republicans. We'll have more details later in the show on who may be the next Republican House Speaker if they do indeed retake the House in January. And moving over to the Senate, we do know that Democrats will retain control, but by the skin of their teeth. After a come-from-behind victory by Democrat Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada, the Democrats retain control of the Senate this weekend. Regardless of if the Republicans win the likely runoff election in Georgia, Democrats will retain the Senate because Vice President Kamala Harris would have the deciding vote in the case of a 50-50 split on Capitol Hill. And we'll discuss the Georgia Senate race in just a bit. But Jake, let's recap some of the highly contested races. We'll start with the House race here in central New York in just our backyard. The New York 22nd congressional race between Democrat Francis Canole and Republican Brandon Williams was just called in favor of Williams a short time ago. And looking at the results, Williams maintained his lead since early last week, but not by much. Williams declared victory last Tuesday night, but now it's official. And remember, Canole came into, the, into this race leading the polls and with a lot of momentum after being endorsed by Syracuse Mayor Ben Walsh. So let's start the discussion tonight with all eyes focusing on this race. It's November 14th, it's a Monday. The race was November 8th. Why is it taking six days for this race to be called? You know, Ben, like you said, it's taken a while for this race to be called, and that's mainly because they're waiting to count the mail-in ballots. The deadline for counting those is tomorrow on November 15th, and those mail-in ballots that came in on November 8th will not be counted until then. So mail-in ballots really the main reason why it's taking so long for um, this race to be called. Right, and we saw the decision just called it, but it's not official yet in our books because there's still a roughly 8,000 more absentee ballots that need to be counted in the rural counties, the state of New York states. The ballots can be in the inbox of the election commission on November, after November 8th, but starting November 15th, tomorrow and Wednesday, they'll be count the ballots. So Canole will need at least 70% of those votes to get back into this race. Yeah, and Canole gets the amount of votes that we're talking about right here. There is a new law in New York that if it's a 0.5 margin of difference between the two candidates, it'll automatically go to a recount. So we may not even know the result of this race until up to a month later, because just like I said, it could go to a recount if Canole gets those votes that he's looking for with these absentee ballots. Right, and in. the Republicans in the rural county showed up for Williams, and Williams appears to be the front runner and likely will win this race. But now moving on to the Georgia Senate race, Democrat Raphael Warnock has the lead over Republican challenger Herschel Walker. We know this race has been in talks with a lot of controversy surrounding the Walker campaign, but Warnock's lead just does not matter yet. This race is likely heading to a runoff election because neither candidate won at least 50% of the vote, which is required in Georgia for it to be an official race. And this is deja vu of the state's 2020 Senate election when Senator David Perdue faced Democratic challenger John Ossoff in a runoff election. Perdue had more votes on election night but lost to Ossoff in the runoff. The tentative runoff election date is set for Tuesday, December 6. Ben, could we see Walker defeat Warnock in the runoff just like Ossoff did against Purdue two years ago? Well, two years ago on election night, we saw that David Purdue had more votes than John Ossoff, but neither, neither candidate reached the 50% margin, which is why we saw that January runoff of that year. Ossoff, of course, did beat Purdue to get, uh, get, get the Democrats the control of the Senate. But another thing that we need to talk about here is that there's a libertarian candidate between Walker and Warnock. That libertarian candidate in this race has 2% of the vote, and usually in traditional years, 
libertarian votes will go towards the Republican candidate. Walker could possibly win this race. Ben, just like you said, that libertarian candidate is important in this race. Chase Oliver receiving 2% of the votes. But when you think about it, Walker and Warnock, if that libertarian candidate wasn't there, we likely wouldn't even be seeing a runoff. So if Walker can pick up those libertarian votes, then we'll probably see him walk away with a win on December 6th. Right, it's definitely something that we could see. Walker could possibly win this race, but also we're going to see millions of millions of dollars invested in this race just for the next month. Absolutely, Ben. And we've already seen so much money put into this race. And another thing I think we could see from Republicans in Georgia is they saw the Republicans lose these midterms largely across the country. So that could motivate them to get out and vote. And speaking of races where there was a lot of money invested, let's talk about where the only flipped seat came on election night. That is the state of Pennsylvania, which was between the Democrat John Fetterman and Republican challenger and TV doctor who was backed by former President Donald Trump, Mehmet Oz. Fetterman won this race by more than 4%. And with millions of dollars invested by both sides, it seemed to be anyone's race on election night. Fetterman, who suffered a stroke months ago, was able to pull away with the victory over Oz. Now, Ben, this race seemed to test Trump's influence on American politics. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Right, we saw Trump, he put a lot of energy into a lot of races, specifically the Pennsylvania gubernatorial race where we saw the Democrat beat his Republican-backed candidate. Just like this race where Fetterman beat Dr. Oz, his, his supporter. J.D. Vance, let's talk about Ohio. J.D. Vance was one of Trump's biggest uh, supporters in the 2020 presidential cycle. Trump, of course, backed him and he won that race. But this is a definitely an interesting race because Fetterman it looked to be, it was a very close polls on election night. We thought maybe Oz could come from behind and win because Fetterman was battling the health issues. And Ben, I think that's an important thing to consider in this Pennsylvania Senate race with Fetterman's health issues. And I think it's almost important to consider the candidates over the politics in this race. 50% of voters in exit polling done by NBC News said that they, they thought that Fetterman was not fit to be a senator after having that stroke. But on the, but on the other side, 56% of voters said that they thought Mehmet Oz had not lived in Pennsylvania long enough to represent them in the Senate. So I think it's interesting to look at the voters' concerns over the candidates in this race over the politics. Well, this was essentially a race where uh, we didn't know who was going to win because Adamant, of course, had his health issues and Oz, you know, was not from Pennsylvania and he thought he was getting attacked on. But let's talk about another race where Trump put most of his energy into, and that is the state of Arizona. Trump put a lot of energy into the Arizona gubernatorial election, but that race right now seems to be Demo uh, favoring the Democratic candidate at this hour. Katie Hobbs has lead over her Republican opponent, Carrie Lake, and this race is just too, too close to be called at this moment. And with at least 98% of the vote in, Hobbs has a comfortable lead with just a few more thousand votes needed to be counted. Approximately 25,000 voters separate the two tonight. Ben, how much of a chance does Lake still have to win this race? Well, the key thing to note is that this race, 98% of the vote is in. But this race has not been called yet because no one knows how this is going to go. We're still waiting for approximately 100,000 more ballots from Maricopa County, which is home to Phoenix. And usually these metropolitan areas where there's a major city, those tend to be more left. Terry Lake is surprisingly getting a lot of votes here, even though Hobbs is getting the majority of votes in Maricopa County. If she gets enough votes in Maricopa County, she might win this race. Ben, I think that's really important to note here. Maricopa County was one of the counties that was under a lot of scrutiny from the GOP after the 2020 election. A lot of GOP leaders saying that the election was fraudulent in Maricopa County. So just like you said, Carrie Lake could get a lot of votes there because that could work to motivate a lot of Republican voters to come out and vote specifically in that county. Right, and this race is just way too close to be called because at the end of the day, no one knows who's going to win this race. There are still a handful of ballots that still need to be counted in Arizona. Carrie Lake has yet to concede, but Katie Hobbs has yet to claim victory herself. When talking points for turns, the 2022 midterms are over, and it is time to look towards the 2024 presidential election cycle. Trump might be running, but he's expected to have a lot of Republican challengers. We'll discuss that after the break.
Welcome back to Talking Points. Former President Donald Trump is once again teasing another run for the White House. Trump says he will be giving a major announcement tomorrow night at 9 p.m. at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach. Talking Points analyst Anna Salevich is here to break down what this potential Trump speech could mean for American politics. Anna, thanks so much for joining us. Anna, thanks for coming on tonight. And we know for the past few months, Trump has been teasing this White House bid for now months, and if not if, even years, since he's lost the White House, he's been teasing a comeback bid for 2024. But some of his advisors are advising him not to run, or at least suspend his announcement tomorrow night. Why is this? A lot of his advisors think that um, announcing his 2024 campaign tomorrow would pose a lot of risks for Trump himself and the GOP as a whole. Um, a big concern is the potential Georgia uh, Senate runoff race that's going to happen in December. People just um, think that if Trump announces um, his campaign tomorrow that Democrats will just be more motivated to go turn out and vote and just because they're so against um, Trump. And um, another big concern is Trump was expecting to just kind of ride off of this massive red wave and he endorsed a lot of um, candidates that ended up losing. So his advisors just don't think it's a good time. And Anna, we know that Trump was urged to delay this announcement and especially not to announce it before the midterms, but now we're six days removed from election night. What type of risk could this speech impose for Trump? So the RNC um, will not pay Trump's legal bills if uh, he does make this campaign announcement tomorrow. And he also may face a lot of campaign financing restrictions. Um, yeah, so we're a lot of, uh, uh, it also gives Trump's um, opposing candidates an opportunity to kind of just kind of see where his campaign is going wrong and, and gauge what that means for uh, how to improve their campaign. Um. Let's bring Talking Points analyst Luke Riddell into the, Riddell, excuse me, into the discussion. We practiced in the, the pre-show, but no my bad on that. First Luke, time on, I expect. Listen, it. Luke, we just mentioned Trump is likely running again in 2024. Yeah. What else can we expect from the Republicans? Who's going to throw their hat into the ring in this race? You know, it is going to be a wide open ball game right now because it seems like the establishment figures, the people that be, do not want it to be Donald Trump in 2024. We could see Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin throw his hat into the ring, former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, and... The one that a lot of people in the Republican media are hoping for is Ron DeSantis. Take a look at some of the front covers we've seen from the Rupert Murdoch own New York Post. They are hoping that Ron DeSantis can be the future of the Republican Party. You see there their Wednesday cover that has Ron DeSantis as the future presidential nominee in 2024 and also refers to the former president as Trumpy Dumpty. It is very clear that they are not looking for Donald Trump to be the nominee in 2024 just based off the performance of his Senate endorsed candidates like Dr. Oz, Don Bulldog in New Hampshire. Sure, Blake Masters in Arizona. They say we've had enough with Donald Trump. You know, Luke, I think those are some interesting points to consider about Trump because we take a look at the other candidates and we have DeSantis, who's more of an extreme conservative, but we also have an option like Larry Hogan. And after we saw the GOP lose these midterms so badly and we saw this big surprise from the Democrats in this, these midterms, I think it's possible that we could see a more moderately conservative candidate start to pick up momentum within the party, someone like Larry Hogan. But speaking of all those candidates and Trump, Anna, we were just talking about Trump's announcement coming tomorrow. Do you think that he'll run again? And if he does, do you think he'll find success? I think Trump will definitely run again. I don't know. I think, you know, a lot of, um, he does have a big following, so I think that they will definitely come out and vote. But I think, you know, in comparison to um, people like DeSantis, I don't think that he has as strong of a chance as he did in the past. And we got to talk about the other political party, and that's the Democrats. President Biden, we know he's going to be 82 on election night in 2024. Some people are concerned that he may be too old to run again. Do you see another candidate? I'll ask Luke this, this question as well. Do you, both of you guys, do you guys see another candidate running against Biden, or do you think Biden runs again? Well, look, we've been seeing a lot of talk from the Democrats about potential candidates coming out in 2024. We've seen Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, pitches a strong possibility. After the strong performance of Democrats in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor there, has been talked about. But President Joe Biden is taking a victory lap. He held a press conference at the White House last week. He was asked about low approval ratings, and here's what he had to say about the fact that most Americans don't want him to run again in 2024. Two-thirds of Americans in exit polls say that they don't think you should run for re-election. What is your message to them, and how does that factor into your final decision about whether or not to run for re-election? It doesn't. What's your message to them? To those two-thirds of Americans? Watch me. So Biden still says that he intends to run in the 2024 election. Well, it remains to be seen whether he'll have any primary challengers in that race. 
Luke, speaking of those primary challenges, I'm going to throw it right over to Anna here. If we see Biden running that race, or if we don't see him running that race, who do you see coming out of the Democratic Party as a potential challenger or as a potential nominee? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure on that one. Um, definitely yeah. definitely plenty of candidates that we could possibly see. We, we could see Gavin Newsom, uh, maybe you think Governor Kathy Oakle here in New York, maybe she'll run again. I, I highly doubt it, but I think it's, I think it's Biden's I party. always say even possibly Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. Right. Well, look, I can't count out totally Vice President Kamala Harris on that front, even though we've seen a couple of clips from her on the campaign trail uh, that have led to some fodder for Republican media. Well, Luke Riddell and Anna Sawevich, thank you so much for coming on tonight and giving your, your take on this. Tuesday was expected to be a good night for Republicans. Usually the party out of power makes significant gains in the House, Senate, and governorships, but that was not the case this year. Republicans were challenged on topics such as abortion and election denial, which made it harder for them to win in some battleground states. Here with us now to explain why Democrats were able to stop the red wave and maintain control of the Senate is Talking Points analyst Noah Gutfleisch. Noah? Thank you. So Tuesday, Democrats shocked the nation by exceeding poll numbers, holding the Senate, and losing fewer seats than expected in the House. Uh, multiple reasons why this occurred. Uh, one major factor in uh, one major factor was abortion. A few states, CNN and Exit Poll had uh, abortion as the second biggest uh, issue to voters at 27%. Abortion, was, abortion referendums were on the ballot in Kentucky, Michigan, Montana, and Vermont, and pro-choice options won in all cases. Abortion could have also been eliminated in North Carolina and Pennsylvania if, lawmakers, if Republican lawmakers won, but they lost. And it was expected, and, it, and uh, uh, abortion turned out many liberals and young people, which could be a big, f which could be a big factor why Democrats ex exceeded polls even with the unpopular Democratic president. But a bigger factor, especially in the Senate and the gubernatorial races, was poor Republican candidates. Multiple Senate candidates, such as Adam Laxalt, Blake Masters, and Don Bullduck, all supported election denial, and all three lost. Uh, similar story with governorships. Doug Mastriano, Tim Michaels, and Tudor Dixon, who all cast a doubt on the election in 2020 in swing states, all lost. Dixon and Mastriano even lost by over 10 points. Election denial was simply not a winning formula for Republicans this year, and many believe, may believe that Donald Trump's uh, and may believe that Donald Trump repeating election denial did not help, and this is, and that's why many of these candidates lost. And many blame him because many blame him specifically for this, and also many bl blame Mitch McConnell and our, and Republican chair and Republican campaign chair Rick Scott for poor candidate quality and for, for poor candidate quality. And it seems that Republican or that Freedom Caucus uh, chair Andy Biggs is expected to challenge Kevin McCarthy as as Republican leader for the House, and there has been. A, uh, speculation that Mar uh, Kevin McCarthy might not even have the votes to become Speaker of the House should the Republicans win and leave the caucus. The biggest result of this midterms is that the GOP will ha have a lot of finger pointing while Democrats will celebrate their victories. Democrats, Democrats uh, had a very successful night and exceeded expectations. All Republicans seem to be, Republicans seem to have a disappointing night where they will have to figure out what to do next. Jake and Ben, back to you. No, Gutfleisch, thank you. Ballot counting in the past two major elections has been relatively slow. Some races still yet to be called six days later. We'll discuss why counting is taking longer when Talking Points returns in 90 seconds. Stay with us. Well, Thomas, you've got three day of... ...got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time.
Welcome back to Talking Points. You've seen in the past two major election cycles, voting has been slow in some states, and many Americans, including myself, are wondering why that may be. Talking Points analyst Jacob Bernardini is here to explain why this may be. Jacob, thank you for coming on the show tonight. We've seen in the past two major election cycles, the 2020 presidential election cycle and this 2022 midterm cycle. We still don't know if some of the races are, are six days removed from the election night. Well, I think there's two reasons for that. One is that for two elections in a row, we've been had really tight elections. 2020 was one of the tightest and most contested presidential elections in history. And now we have this midterm. Everyone expected to be a red wave year. Turns out it was not that. It's more of an even year an overperformance for Democrats, and that's resulting in a lot of close races. Another reason why is that more people are voting by mail now, and that's delaying results in certain states. And speaking of mail-in states and mail ballots in certain states, I'm seeing a, a constant trend in the West Coast state, states, Nevada, California, Arizona. Those three states have many of their congressional races have yet to be called. Is that a trend that I'm just catching, or why, is, why are they so slow to count ballots? That's definitely a trend you're catching, and that's because there have been some new laws that have been implemented in some of these states and just overall trends with how they vote. In Nevada, for instance, just like California in 2020, they gave every voter a mail-in vote. That means that everyone gets to vote by mail in California and as a, in Nevada, and as a result, it's taking a long time to count those votes, especially in overpopulous California, which has a lot of districts to get through. Another thing with Arizona is that they've always been a mail voting state since back in the 90s. They, in fact, do a lot of their early voting by mail, but recently controversies brought on by the conservatives about drop, on, drop ballots inside the state of Arizona have caused people to say, you should drop off your ballot on election day instead. So as a result, Maricopa County has more votes they have to count on election day than they initially thought, and it's causing delays in the election. Talking Points analyst Jacob Bernardini in his official Talking Points debut. Thank you so much for spotting the trends of us this evening. Jake Morrow, what do you have for us at the desk? Ben, thank you. President Biden is currently away from the White House as he travels to Indonesia for the G20 Leaders Summit. Earlier today, President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping met one-on-one -on -one in their first interaction since Biden took office. Here to break down what was said during the discussion is Talking Points analyst Harrison Calder. Harrison, thanks so much for joining us. Now let's get right into it here. What took place during this meeting today and what did Biden tell us about it afterwards? So this was the first head-to-head -head meeting between these two as main leaders of their individual countries, which is a huge factor. Of course, Biden making ca cases about uh, the uh, PRC, which is the People's Republic of China, making sure that they would take care of global economic stability, debt relief, and a bunch of other issues, and how the two countries could communicate, how both are large nations, how they both would stay in touch, keep on track, and be able to work together to solve a lot of issues globally. And after that meeting, we saw Biden make some comments about China's stance on Taiwan. What did he specifically say about the possibility of China invading Taiwan? So he said if they were to invade Taiwan, they would jeopardize the uh, global economy. That would cause a lot of problems throughout the entire world. And he also said that um, he will stand by these specific countries, especially Taiwan in this case, to protect them, to make sure they are safe. And he mentioned uh, the uh, non-economic uh, market practices that they're, uh, excuse me, that the PRC is imposing and about how these issues are uh, problematic for America, such as the uh, detaining citizens in America. So a lot of these issues, or excuse me, in China from the American citizens. So, yeah. Harrison Calder, thanks so much for joining us. Coming up on Talking Points, we will have our final thoughts on the 2022 midterm elections. Ben and I will discuss our takeaways after the break. Stay with us. It's not that hard. My big man fingers are having a problem with these little tiny buttons. <laughs> Whoa, watch it there. Your blood pressure's gonna go through the roof. Tell me about it. I'm trying to learn how to get it down. Instead, it keeps going up. High blood pressure can increase the risk for heart attack or stroke. Learn how to keep yours at a healthy range. Ever hear a voice command? Just say, text barbershop to 97779. That's not what I said. Just give me that. Now my blood pressure's up. <sighs> They took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? 
okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to Talking Points. We've been talking about the 2022 midterms for most of the night, but Jake and I wanted to share our key takeaways from election night. Jake, I'll let you go first. Ben, I think my number one takeaway from this election night is the GOP leadership is a huge question mark right now. We saw Democrats go and win a midterms that where President Biden had such a low approval rating, and we saw the Republicans get upset in so many states. But what I, I speak of leadership because thinking about candidates that were heavily backed by President Trump, who was the leader of the GOP, uh, Mehmet Oz lost in the Pennsylvania Senate race. Blake Masters lost in the Arizona Senate race. Doug Mastriano lost in Pennsylvania governor's race. And Tudor Dixon lost in the Michigan governor's race. And that's just to name a few. So I think right now, with Trump heavily backing all of those candidates and all of them losing, the GOP leadership is a big question mark. Right, and you have to wonder as well, it's the Senate leadership as well. We're seeing that possibly R Senator Rick Scott of Florida might want to challenge Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell for a GOP leadership position. Another thing that I want to talk about is the election deniers. We, we talked about the election special just last week. Election deniers was a huge test for independent voters on who they're going to vote for. They're going to choose the country or they're going to choose a party. They chose, in my opinion, they chose the country. Mainly because we saw in many races, we saw in Arizona, the gubernatorial race with Carrie Lake. She was one of Trump's biggest supporters of the how the 2020 election was illegitimate. She's about to lose that race, but listen, we'll hold that thought for net for two weeks from now when we come back to the airwaves. But that's all the time we have for you on this episode of Talking Points. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citrus TV News and like us on Facebook. I'm Benjamin Schiller. And I'm Jake Morell. Have a happy Thanksgiving break, SU. We'll be back on Monday, November 28th. Until then. Have a great night, Syracuse.